<laughs> That's going to annoy the people who like it to be straight. Ah, I can't get it. There we go. Okay. So, welcome to an experiment with uh, trying uh, to create a place for us to have uh, a difficult conversation, but one that we don't get time for and we keep talking about needing to have and a way to kind of get deep into what it is we're trying to um, connect about. Um, so I've been watching, I participated in a, a couple of empathy cafes with Edwin and I really uh, loved the way it was, it made the possibility of uh, practicing those ear muscles that we don't do so much of in, in the XR. And it's, there's lots of talking and not so much ear listening, really deep listening. And I love the way it practiced that. Um, and I, so I thought this might be a way to try to have this kind of conversation. So it's an empathy cafe style. Um, we've got two hours to unfold some dialogue. Hmm. So the, the topic that we're going to talk about is power, our experiences of it, um, how it lands in us, what it feels like. Um, and we've kind of got a, a purpose that maybe at the end of this conversation, we will have a better idea of how to grow the guardianship circle, which has been kind of just a very few people. Um, and it would kind of work as a, as a model because I'm hoping we're gonna see regional groups growing their own guardianship circles. And, and how do we, you know, build in what we've discussed about power into how we grow a guardianship circle that kind of is one of those things that's going to be asked to kind of make, um, I guess, calls about how other, you know, decisions about power and it's going to be hard. So we're going to have um, five, so there's going to be Ideally, there would be four of us and we'll just swap the roles between us. One person is the talker and gets five minutes to speak, to just let themselves unfold on the topic. Um, and they choose a listener out of the other two. And that listener is going to be an active listener who uh, listens to what's being said and then kind of shares back a little of their understanding in their own words of what the person has just said. So you would maybe come have a couple of points and then pause and the other person will share back what they've understood. And the speaker then gets the chance to kind of say, yeah, that was it or no, oh, you missed this bit. And we just kind of, that's how we help each other unfold the dialogue. And the other pe person will be timekeeping. Yes, do. So just clarification, it's not that you talk for five minutes straight, it's that you talk for a little bit, there's a reflection time, you talk for a little bit, there's a reflection time. Yep, that's it. Yeah. yeah. And some of us need shorter reflection times than others, because I don't remember. But yeah, that, and, and as we get better at listening to each other, it'll kind of extend. Um, So it's, and when the, per, and then the person who's listening then becomes the speaker after. So the, the third person is, is timing, making sure that it's, and when the five minutes is up, you get to finish the point you were saying and have it shared back. And then we move on to the next person. Uh, the listener becomes the speaker, chooses another person. It could be straight back at that person. Or it could be the other person and the timings, the timer swaps. And we just keep doing that for two hours and the, the level of the kind of depth of where we go in our thinking, we're informing each other and we're going deep. And maybe after an hour, we could see if that might be a point where we stop the kind of just uh, dialoguing and start to wonder about what might be a best practice for growing our group. 
How does that sound? All right. Okay, to you, Ian. Okay. Ah, so we're all responsible for holding the practice. It's not really one person facilitating. And you don't need to use your five minutes as well. You could say, once you've kind of got the point out your head that you were talking about, you could just kind of say, right, I, I feel heard now. That's kind of, that's enough for now. And pass it on. So you don't need to do your whole five minutes. Hmm. The a points for a listener would just be to give your full attention, to be as supportive. And try and share back in your own words what you understood. Okay, that seems like I've got all the points. So I'll begin and I would like to invite you to listen, Stu. Oh, this is the check-in bit. No, I won't. So a check-in. I mean, I, I had this idea that maybe we could check in with our memories of how we met. Just a short story of where did we meet and what impact it had would be nice. I don't, you two met before me, didn't you? So one of you could start. Ian, did we meet at the Heathrow action? We must have both been around in nearly the same place. <laughs> like at the pub afterwards or something, maybe we met. I didn't go to the pub afterwards. I was hanging around at Grove Heathrow. Uh, okay. And I didn't go up the road to the pub. So maybe the intro training the next weekend. It will have been something like that, or the first gathering, or, you know. Were you at that intro training? I have very sketchy details for stuff that was four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember our time in jail together. Um, I remember the intro training where it was, I mean, it's Roger, Simon, Gale giving it, and they had this PowerPoint slide that had all kinds of figures from history going through of, I don't think I went to that one. You went at that one, then we went to the pub afterwards. Um, yeah, I know I met Al really. Before then, even it might. Uh, so you're, kind of, you're kind of a fixture now, Stu. <laughs> Always been there. Yeah. <laughs> it might have been before, I can't remember now. It's... And that was us rising up, was it? You were yeah, rising yeah, yeah. up by then, yeah. Okay. My, my sort of introduction was I went to an NVDA training that Eddie Arthur ran in uh, Mayday Rooms. Then I went to the action of shutting down Heathrow with Izzy. I met Izzy that day and uh, Richard Canatuna and Jenny. They were all in my little affinity group. A couple others, but I don't remember who. And then, yeah, the pub afterwards and then the next weekend was the intro training. Um, and then I did, like, wasn't around until the Earth First Winter Moot, I think was the next thing. Yeah. And that's where I met you. Uh, the following year, I think. Ah, right. Okay. The one in Sheffield. Yeah. So it was the one in Manchester that I right. went to first and then came home from that and set up the Bristol Rising Up group. But then, yeah, the next one in Sheffield, that was where we met, was it? Yep. Yeah, I went to one of your workshops. Um, it was kind of a connecting workshop, you know, it was that kind of heart-centered connection. Do you, do you remember what that was about? It might have been an introduction to Rising Up, but you did a lot of work on uh, kind of connecting the people. It was maybe two hours in that downstairs cold room in that garage. Was it the Beyond Blockers? which is now the Rebellion for Life, is for life, not just for... No, I don't think so. Because it was, it was a, yeah. Anyway, I, I remember thinking, this is about connection. I like these people because it's kind of rooted in people. It wasn't kind of an action, action one. Mm -hmm. And um, Ian, we met at the campaign against the arms trade. 
Yeah. That was a... <laughs> While you were being arrested, I believe. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Needed a home for your shruti box. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was it. You looked after it. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was my first time at being arrested. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, we have. And that, so, yeah, I met you there. Then I met you. Did you, Were you in Sheffield? Yeah. Yes. And I think it was because you were, you had interested me that I went to Stu's workshop. So, yeah. Mm. I remember that workshop. Yeah, it was, it was the intro training, I think, wasn't it? Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was in that funny sort of cold storage cellar thing, wasn't it? And mm. Yeah, I remember that. It was two and a half years ago, wasn't it? Yep, that's a while. Mm. That would have been two years ago, I suppose, if it was the winter moot. Yeah. It was winter yep. moot weekend, isn't it? Oh. Wow, that is, is that all? Two years? Oh my goodness. Yeah, I think that was two years ago. It was Bridge Five Mill the year before. We've packed a lot in. That's <laughs> something all goes kind of blurred. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. That was uh, that was a really that was nice to hear. After after about mid twenty seventeen, time seemed to speed up. But the number of people coming into your life and the stuff going on just seemed to go on some exponential curve. <laughs> Once we start doing. I in London is. It's plateaued at the moment, right? No, mine's still going mental at the moment. Is it? Okay. Yeah, mine. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really conscious that this is, um, you know, it kind of really, we've been very lucky that this group, the guardianship group, has helped us stay connected. Mm. And that the other people that I met at that time as well have all kind of, um, you know, we've all got other work that we're doing but this has helped us stay connected mm -hmm. and uh, whereas I haven't stayed so connected to some of the other people that are really busy and off in other circles so that's something I'm really grateful that the guardianship circle has given me that uh, strengthening of connection with you all yeah I think it's been very supportive for all of us it's a good thread, isn't it? That I'm glad that we set up this team. Yeah. When the review and restructure predates <laughs> the health organising system. Yeah. yeah, and then, that, and then you know, then there's this kind of. So I'd love to start. Who would like to time? I'd like to talk to you, Stu. Okay. Would you oh, Would you give us the timing, Ian? Yeah. Five well, minutes. Thank yeah. you. Oh, I'm going to have trouble timing because I don't. Oh, yeah, I can do it here. Yeah. Get it to the nearest minute. <laughs> yes, thank you. A little you. timer in the top right of the computer, isn't there, on, on Zoom? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I guess. I, so then I'm looking at. Uh, well, I. We talked about our story, you know, of how we met. And what I don't know is the story of your relationship with power. I know that I've been thinking about it a lot this last year as, um, and it, it, I have had nothing to disabuse me of the belief that power corrupts. I, I've seen nothing that says that's not true. And so I have, you know, my whole life been very happy to go, mm -mm, no thanks, don't want the power, let's share, let's collaborate, let's. And I have there, and I've kind of shoved away any sense, for instance, that just being a white woman in this world gives me a sense of power. Um, gives me a responsibility. And I've never really engaged with that at all. I'll pause there and see. Um, thanks. So I'm hearing you say um, that uh, power corrupts and that that idea that you've had has been reinforced and you've not seen anything alternative to that um, really happening. 
Um, and so because of that, you have habitually given away power and, and moved away from it. Um, and yet also recognizing that you do have some power um, and you're trying to relate to that with an attitude of responsibility. Yeah, I mean, I guess qualifying it with the fact that it's my lived experience. It's so, you know, I don't believe everybody thinks that way. And also that it's, um, I don't think it's so much that I gave it away as I've been living the kind of story uh, in my head that I don't kind of play that game, that power game. Um, and because of that, I haven't been engaging with the types of power that actually I do have. Um, I don't have any practice and I don't, so I kind of, and I don't have any sense of, uh, or lived experience of connection with the responsibility that comes with it because I pretend kind of it's invisible. I don't to me that I don't engage with it. Um, and the sort of training that we've been doing and the lived experience of this last year, two years has, you know, shifted my thinking about that tremendously. Um, along with the recognition that by sheer persistence of staying with it and staying connected, that I, there is a level of power running between all of us who've been here from the beginning and how it, it weighs heavily on me. How do we engage responsibly with that power? I'll pause there. Um, so I, th I think you're saying that, that you're recognizing that there is power, um, that we have, um, and that by being sort of engaged for a long period of time, by having some deep rooted connections, um, sort of there is power that comes with that. There's, we seem to have power or well, you're seen to have power in, in the movement. Um, and it's about in, like um, a struggle to engage with that. Um, yeah, engage with it responsibly, I guess. Mm. I'm wondering if I missed something there. I feel like I did. It's, maybe Maybe struggle isn't the word, but it's definitely something that uh, in engaging with a kind of active reach for some of the work that needs done in my thinking around decolonization. Thank you. Thanks Ian. Uh, around decolonization, it's uncovered um, I guess ways that I have been participating in power play that I didn't know about. And so rather than thinking it's a fresh pot, it's um, actually, I've got things to work on internally. That's enough. Thank you. Um, so just to reflect that a little bit back. Um, uh, I heard you bring in the term decolonization and how that's a personal journey um and um yeah um that was more or less it yeah yeah <laughs> I th thank you took too many words thank you uh so now it passes to you Stu, and you get to choose a listener um yeah i'll talk to ian right no and thank you um, yeah, so and talking about power, <laughs> I want to go straight to the stuff which is more difficult to talk about and more edgy, which is about sex. Um, because 
it is present for me and it's also one of the biggest pitfalls of power for male assigned people um, like throughout organizations in history um, when I was organizing rising up meetings in my living room um, and I was often the facilitator and the one who would cook the food and there were people attending who were um, um, sexually attractive to me and also often younger than me and things like this there was this dynamic instantly came in of um, and I tried to be, live as consciously as I could around that and um, you know developing practices of consent and, and all of that and it's not like I was sleeping with everyone who came to the meetings or anything like that um, but there was um, there was definitely struggles around it and when I was showing up over the summer around Europe running trainings I just don't want to leave that hanging actually when I say there's definitely struggles around it um, I want to clarify that there was no like allegations of abuse or anything like that or any sort of um, thing yeah issues like that it's just that I was recognizing that I, I was in a position of power and there was mutual sexual attraction um, and the power dynamics were at play there so I'll pause there So I'm kind of hearing you say it's power is complicated by sexuality and then you feel a sort of a pull on your personal ethics and your sexuality, you know, they're kind of at odds and there's a big tension there. And Feels like that's something you really need to to get out and, and be able to live with. Um, so you say a, a tension between personal ethics. I mean, I, my personal ethics is to not use my sort of to not manipulate somebody into sleeping with me or having sex with me or anything like that due to power and rank dynamics. Um, right, I, I want there to be a, a mutuality in relationship. Um, yeah, pause. I suppose because I think I've what comes before because you've always been very keen on doing these kind of consent workshops and stuff and I, I understand where that comes from when you're speaking like this mm. essentially you're kind of it appears you're trying to educate yourself at the same time or you know to to build yourself boundaries yeah, yeah yeah so and that came in that was heightened this summer when I was traveling around Europe running trainings for all these different XR groups and I would show up in a room and people would know that I was the co-founder. It was advertised on the, you know, event for the trainings. And um, I mean, I realized quite quickly, this is one of the first things I have to address when I step into a room is I need to talk about what does it mean that I'm a co-founder? This does not mean that I'm a walking god and that I can, I get everything right. Um, And um, yeah, gosh, that five minutes seems really short. I'll just end with not being a walking god. <laughs> Somewhat still am. <laughs> the struggle of the ego and the conscience. Oh. Mm.
Thank you, Stu. So, Ian, it's your turn now and you can choose who you'd like to listen to. Should we just keep going around? So I'll speak to you then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lovely. Can you time, Stu? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, power was something I was like pretty unaware of. And it's only really dawned on me this year, you know, people would say, oh, you've got structural power. And I kind of, have I? I didn't know that. Um, and I suppose that comes from kind of, you know, my schooling, which was looking back on it was pretty much 10 years of gaslighting, you know, that um, no one would ever want to hear what we had to say or we needed opinion. We just needed to sit down quietly and follow instructions. Um, and I'm realizing quite how deep that goes. And so then for me, this personal power comes with this struggle with like low self-esteem. Um, and it's trying to work out, you know, where having self-esteem sets into narcissism and where low self-esteem is kind of false modesty and it's trying to, um, it's trying, like trying to hold yourself in the middle of that and I'm entering that funny phase now where I say people know who you are before you know them and you haven't met and that is just a really weird you know that kind of that just doesn't happen to working class people you know <laughs> people will come up and say are you Ian Bray and it's like what does that mean you know and that is really difficult to deal with I'll get comes to terms with Mm. Mm. Thank you. I'm hearing that I that you are uh, recognizing an an internal wrestling or with with uncomfortableness at that sense that people know you before you even walk into a room, and that kind of that it it sets you maybe off balance and it's made you look back at what your engagement with kind of compliance and authority and being and just sitting quietly and listening how that's affected your self-esteem more than anything you know what and that it, it that makes it really uncomfortable for you to step into that role of kind of uh people wanting your time and your opinions and your uh, choices on things as if, you know, you've got some kind of knowledge that they don't, maybe. Yeah, that's absolutely it. But it's, say, so you, you don't realise, it takes a long time to realise that you're still struggling with things that were part of your, your essentially your childhood. My mum was always one of those, you know, don't get a big head, don't get getting big ideas about yourself, you know, don't get jumped up. You know, I think she was very afraid of producing narcissists in the world. Um, <laughs> I think she must went too far the other way. Um, you know, which is one of the things when they talk about the class dynamic in XI, it's, 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 I kind of meet middle class people who sort of literally believe they can walk on water and are immortal. Um, this is really, really difficult to deal with. It's such a kind of culture shock. Most people I kind of grew up around were of, of, a, of a sort of fairly similar disposition, really, I think. So it's very, to suddenly be not sort of thrown into it, but to be just put on the thin end of this, this thing about being known and, and say, kind of respected for something essentially you haven't done is, is really slightly unnerving. Mm. And like you say, it changes your relationship with women when you meet them to some extent and kind of becoming aware of that as well. And it is, there are all these things you kind of have to be sort of helicoptering above yourself to look down and say, you know, what am I doing and how do I have a right ordered life in, in respect of all of this. So it's quite a, such a spiritual challenge as well. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I, I get the, um, 
I got a real sense that there was um, that 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 the discomfort of being of noticing the kind of uh, I guess structurally the class differences, you know, of and I, I really liked the way that you tied that into how you're feeling um, how when you go into local groups or it's people that you don't know how they kind of automatically have assumptions that you know something they don't or and that that's you see that in the people around you they seem to be able to deal with that a lot easier was what I heard and maybe that it's your background that makes that uncomfortable for you you're not used to people kind of maybe you've engaged with people on a different equality level balance level mm. and that's been oppressed which is literally not what we were bred for you know <laughs> thank you thank you okay mm. Does this continue now? That yes, now it does. We just keep going. So, because it helps us like go deeper. So, I'm going to choose Ian. I'm okay. going to throw it back at you when you come back. Because hmm. okay. just the wind's blowing the door open. It's that window outside. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I. Yeah. Thank you. I really um, appreciate. There was something about that bit about. Um, noticing how other people treat you. I suppose I'm really, I'm a lot less connected to the uh, to the sexual dynamics and that might be actually a feeling of mine because, or not a feeling, but something that I'm uh, not noticing. Of course, you know, we have, diff of course, we have different experiences already. And I'm a woman of a, you know, I've, I've um, reached a certain point in my life where the sort of sexual game playing or engagement connection is a lot less relevant to me. Um, and that's not of everybody of that. It's just, that's how it's appearing in me. And I'm, so I kind of don't really notice it. But when I've had it pointed out to me about kind of the difficulties that other people might struggle with in that, then I kind of notice it going on and it's a bit more, um, I can have um, then maybe more compassion for people that are uh, per uh, perpetuating it or involved in it. I guess I'm not. So I feel quite disconnected from that bit, I, I guess. It's the idea for me of, well, what I feel out of alignment. I feel out of um, with the power bit because there's in my head it says power corrupts you. So I don't want to have power and yet there is, and I recognize I'm using little threads of power and uh, that makes me feel uncomfortable. And I, so I've been thinking about how do I hold myself to it? People in public office go through all kinds of kind of trainings of how to stay within, <laughs> play that game. Well, what is ours? How are we evolving uh, as a way to be accountable to ourselves as much as to each other and to the movement? That's what I'm trying to reach for. I'll pause there. There may not have been any point. <laughs> I think you're saying you, you know, maturity um, is a great help in these things around the sexual dynamics. 
and Yeah, it's hard to pick much more out of that, I think. I, I'm, so I'm not a brilliant listener as it is. You know, I, find it hard, I only get an impression of things, and that was kind of my first impression. Yeah. And Actually, then it's I... It's hard to be thinking about stuff. Yeah. Which, <laughs> and I, but what you just said was a, just a perfect nugget. I wish I had said that, because it was perfect, yeah. Maturity makes this that bit easier for me, I think. Um, and so really, then I'm looking at, how do I hold myself in accountability for the other bits of structural power? So I can see, um, for me, it's been trying to look through this lens of principles and values. You know, we have these principles and values. What are they good for? And they're not just kind of good for organizing things or mobilizing people or you know and they're not just terms and condition tick boxes there's something we could really these could be the filter through which first and foremost we hold ourselves accountable to experiment with that and secondly how to hold us accountable as a group. So if we're thinking about evolving a guardianship circle of making it grow, sprouting new guardians in this group, thank you. How do we use the principles and values to do that? That's my thought. I don't think there's an awful lot to say about that. You know, it's, that's clearly your aspiration. Um, and it's quite a good one. Um, I wonder if you, it's, it's, you've got some underlying what your level of personal principles and values are and, and how that interacts with the XR ones. It's kind of a question rather than observation. You know, because it started me thinking down, down those lines now. Mm. Thank you. But I can't be naughty. I can't stay disciplined to some of this stuff. <laughs> no, it's perfect as it is. Thank you. It's your chance to choose a listener. My turn again, isn't it? Yep. The listener becomes the speaker. Okay, go on then, Stu. <sighs> Where was I going to go? Because this is the trouble when I'm hearing other people speak, stuff starts popping into my mind. And it's, it's like, you know, I think it's in that conversation of thing, are you a keen to listen or a way to speak? But unfortunately, I think often I'm a way to speak person. Um, something to do with kind of your neurotypes and the way you take stuff in. Um, Around power, it's really interesting in all the like personality type of things like Belbin and Myers Briggs. I always come across, I, I'm never one of the kind of like organizing, powery type people. It's really, and I've kind of never been interested. I've never been interested in having sort of um, rank or being in charge of stuff, kind of actively avoid it. Um, um, and say on the Myers-Briggs thing, I'm kind of an INTP, so I'm introvert and intuitive. And that, that seems to mitigate against wanting to direct people. If it, if it ever comes down to things about ideas, it kind of, I'm more interested in finding the right idea, whoever it is, whether it's mine or anybody else's. Um, and then going back to what you were saying, April, is about the, the advantage with the the personal engagement and the sexuality thing is that as you get older and your testosterone levels drop, it, it makes it a bit easier to, it's still there, but you can kind of see it. You're not possessed of it. So it's really, really huge advantage of getting older. <laughs> it's, you know, um, but around that, I've, I'm, I'm what you describe as kind of a serial monogamist. I've never been interested in sexualities like conquests or, you know, scoring points or in terms of power or anything. 
Um, yeah, so that kind of it's brought up loads of things in my head. All right. Um, so something you're saying is that when other people are talking, um, you find yourself sort of taken off onto rabbit trails to talk about those things, whatever those, whatever is becomes present because of the <coughs> influence of other people. Um, and it, in some way that takes you out of yourself. It seemed to be what you were saying that there was, you were quite easily diverted by the speech of others. Um, and then talking about being intuitive and introverted, um, sort of seemed to be that you were then saying that you didn't seek to have um, a lot of influence of others around you, except when it came to um, something around ideas and wanting ideas to be spread. Um, I think he said something like that. And then also with around um, lower levels of testosterone and that reducing sex drive and serial monogamy being helpful in sort of not leading to um, so much sexual issues around power for you. I'm not sure if I quite caught the thing around ideas and um, how your influence there. And not that you have to speak to it, but I just, that's my reflection. Well, it's kind of interesting where ideas are concerned. I've always been interested in, or, you know, where problem solving is concerned is kind of finding the right solution, not, not the one that's mine. Whereas when I've done lots of problem solving exercises in management and engineering you get a lot of people who are possessed and they want their idea to be the one regardless if it's, if it's the best one out there to solve the problem you know it's my idea so i've got to win with my idea whereas i've always had like an ability to like which is the best idea in like in in, in, in practical terms and and how do we do that which seems to be a relatively unusual quality because so many people are just, right, I've got an idea, right, we just go for this, even if it's patently absurd. Um, and there's, you know, it always ends up with a lot of battles with people, I've, I've, a lot of the struggles, and I kind of, like, I just want to leave it at that point. Because, it, and I, I suppose that's why I've ended up as a Quaker, because it's about finding the right ordering, which is not necessarily your ordering. And then around principles and values, obviously for me, it overlays um, the Quaker approach to this, which is a lot about getting over your ego, and it's a lot of people who are Quakers are, are, are sort of introverts. And it's very complex. And then obviously there's also within Quakers, there's a very high bar of kind of behavioral standards and conduct to, to jump over. And I'm always constantly aware of that, you know, that if you go around saying you're a Quaker, you're, you're setting yourself a bloody high standard to live up to, you know, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's not something to undertake lightly. Um, so that you, I think you're saying that you have, you seem to have more ability than most to remain detached from um, like advancing a particular idea, your particular idea, and you're more able to um, like evaluate different ideas and go with the one that seems best. And so even if it's not the one that you initially advanced, you're happy to switch to a different idea. Um, and that when people do come with an attachment to an idea that they want to hold on to in advance. Um, you get a bit turned off by that and maybe a, a bit deflated or avoidant of fighting against it. You're just like, oh, fuck it. You go for it then. Make your mistake. Um, and then talk further about Quakerism and how that's helped you 
and I got lost in my own thoughts and need to practice my resting muscles. <laughs> That's what it does to you, isn't it? Uh, you know, that was uh, time. Okay. That was lovely. Thank you. Can I just ask Ian, yes. does, is there anything in the what you were saying about Quakerism you wanted to communicate that I failed to hear and pick up on? No, just that it's like not an easy thing. It's like you don't go into it like you know, with what's in it for me. It's like it's like what does it demand of you? And it's it's demanding. Okay. Thanks. All right, I'll speak to April then if Ian can do the timekeeping. Off you go. <clears throat> so I don't think that power is something that always corrupts. Um, I, I've, it, my relationship to power was transformed by coming across the definition Mickey Kashtan gives of power is the ability to mobilize resources to meet needs. Um, I see that even more generally of like, uh, moving away from the word power because of how it has become a, a really tainted word, but just sort of influence. Um, I am a manifestation of the universe that has influence on the universe around me. Um, and I don't see that as always a negative thing. Um, April, you called for us to have a two hour chat. We ended up having it on a Saturday morning. You ex exerted influence on my life which I'm grateful for in many ways. And, you know, it's like, and I showed up for this and prioritized this because I've got a lot of respect for you um, and believe in a lot of the things that you suggest. Um, so I see that as a, you exerting influence or power. Go ahead. Mm. Mm, thank you. I, I really got that. Um your, that Mickey Kashtan's quote about the mobilizing power being mobilizing resources has helped transform your thinking about power. Mm -hmm. And particularly in relation to how we're working now, really having recognition of the impact that you have in um, having influence and that it helps you to shift that word from power into influence and looking at the impact you have in terms of how you can influence um, those around you. And so I, and I also really heard, <laughs> thank you, the, the uh, kind of an offering that my influence had a, uh, an appreciated impact on you um, by, asking you to prioritize this time this morning for this conversation. Um, and I'm glad you came too. I, yeah, thank you. Um, I had a realization the other week in a group process I was doing around um, white supremacy and racism um, and talking about grappling with that subject that, um, and this came in really intensely. I am like terrified that my life is meaningless. I'm just shit scared that everything I'm doing is completely meaningless. And then I get an idea that, ah, in order to have meaning, one way that I can do that is to have influence on the world around me and shape the world in ways that I believe move it towards beauty and love. Um, then my life will be meaningful. And the context it coming up in is: so how have I, um, how am I ignoring work around my own privilege as a white person um, because it suits me to have greater influence? And then that's true of. Um, gender privilege and, and sort of all the other privileged things. Um, I seek having influence in the world around me. Um, I really want that because I'm so terrified that my life is otherwise meaningless. Pause. 
Well, thank you. Hmm. I see that some of the training that we've been engaging with and hosting and creating, holding space for uh, has, thank you, unfolded some of your, has really influenced some of your thinking about yourself and in the in making the invisible ways that we've been using power and privilege in our lives in them becoming visible to you you're also recognizing that that causes a tension in you because you're actively seeking to have what your life experiences as good influence on the world around you um and now you're becoming aware there's a this tension is that some of that influence is miss is a miss uh, or is a a use of power and privilege that you have ignored um happily in order to have that privilege and now there's the concern that if you don't use that influence that maybe your life won't have meaning and that's a great fear. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yes, I, I feel a real dropping down in my body at that one. I feel a real sense. Um, parts of that. So I'll choose. Uh, I'll ask. Actually, I'll go back to you, Stu, because I almost feel that's really, um, I'm just sharing a sensation in my body of dropping down and into a kind of space of, I suppose, connected empathy with what you just spoke to there. That sense of... Um, neededness neededness in the world um, and that how our meeting like looking at that history of, of us meeting and learning and seeking to take active steps in the world that we're going to that felt needed and that that's probably a hole in me of that kind of not neededness the fear for me rather than not being meaningful is not needed you know uh yeah I, there's a big expression in me of that you know i my husband took his own life my i was given away at birth as adopted as you know my uh, child took off those I can I sense there's this big hole of unneededness I'll pause there mm. so um, I'm hearing that what I said affected you and you felt that in your body um, and that for you the fear is not so much about not having meaning but about being needed. Um, and that that's a long sort of life pattern, life journey for you. Um, and that there are things that you've experienced where there was a sense of neededness, um, including our meeting. Yes, thank you. Spot on. Um, I think also that it wasn't so for me, not just our meeting that I'd had other encounters in those times that had sent me out with a sense of neededness that had sent me seeking people like you. 
um, with a sense of neededness of having giving voice to the other than human world. For me particularly, it was through connection with trees, through singing with trees. I had been given a really, really clear sense that there was a need for someone with a powerful voice to step out into the human hubble bubble of it all and give voice to what was needed by them. Um, so that you gained a sense that um, something that was needed was for the other than human, the trees to be spoken for uh, and brought in, um, I guess, in powerful ways. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's enough. Um, yeah. I think I'm going to ask April to listen. Ian, I know you've been timekeeping for a while, but you have more time. Um, so, viewing power is more about the influence we have in the world. Um, like, has come to help me see that we need, as a movement, to have a lot more influence in the world than we currently have. And that's going to mean that as like a movement is made of individuals having influence, all of us need to have more influence. More of us and each of us needs to have more influence and therefore to step into our power, be able to wield or to use our power, um, you know, because the extractivist colonizer um, sort of force in the world has huge influence, has huge power, enough that it is tearing apart our planetary life system. Uh, yeah, pause. Mm. I hear the connection that in if we recognize that power is having an influence on matters around us, then when you look at that through the kind of umbrella of the whole movement, it's like, how do we ramp up that power? And that's got to come from individuals really stepping up uh, to feel that outward influence and to really step into it and um, be supported to individually have more impact and also collectively we need that it's absolutely necessary for us to shift anything in the kind of corporate deconstruction of our world that's happening right now um an image that came to me um a couple of weeks ago again in process work um during an inner work exercise was we've got a sheet like this and this is the movement and this is the amount of power the movement has um, for any field of influence um, and it can be that it goes like this right and you have one individual who gets shit loads of power and then the rest of the movement around and this is creates a really unstable thing and there's the ability for this one individual to 
move things in really terrible ways, unconscious ways, damaging ways. But if you have, you know, the movement is held up by a bunch of people who have got loads of power each, um, then it becomes a lot flatter. And then one person, you know, over here trying to influence something can only do so much and call the thing in certain ways. But we need the whole thing to rise up. We, you know, it's like, and so the problem comes not when we have influence, it's the problem when comes when we have an imbalance or far too much influence. Um, and the job of those with influence is to distribute it, not to, to diminish themselves, but to pull everyone up around them. And that's why like the Future Democracy Hub is so exciting to me. If let's, it's not just about in the movement, but let's get this going across the land and the lands of the world so that the entire thing, everyone's influence is in. Um, yeah, there, pause. Mm. Thank you, Ian. Just reflecting that, uh, yeah, I really like that example you used from processing work of uh, the sheet. And really demonstrating how a, a influence can be so much more impactful when it's spread flat and you're raising a whole uh, collaboration of energies instead of kind of one energy that yes could be focused and do good in one place or do be useful but it can also with that lack of stability with that without a flatter support of more people supporting around it becomes unstable and can easily misdirect through of course all that we have been conditioned to believe it's kind of the hero myth, the one person that's going to. So we all need to be heroes. <laughs> and I heard your enthusiasm for the Future Democracy Hub. I shall wear. I haven't really looked into that much. Maybe I shall have a look. Thank you. Thanks. Mm. And just add then that Oppor, the movement in Serbia that overthrew Milosevic, Far from saying they're a leaderless organization or movement, they said they're a leaderful. This is a movement of 40,000 or 2 million leaders, whatever it was. Like we are all leaders, and I love that. That's yeah, empowering. For <laughs> yeah, I hear your real passion for helping, supporting us all to step forwards with the use of our influence. Mm. Ian. I would like you to listen, if that's okay. Ah. This has been, uh, this is really fascinating. Um, and I've been, this last six months, kind of really trying to think about ways to, bring the principles and values to life and um, I'm suddenly aware with this new restructuring program that you know we have a an amazing opportunity to really experiment with models we've been doing this all along you know experimenting with how we build the sort of community that can support activism uh, it's part, you know, regenerative cultures, part of the principles and values, you know, um, non-violence, part of the principles and values. And this one, power, is one that we haven't really engaged with because it's, it's just got so much complexity around it. And so for me, I'd love to know how or to use the principles and values the way I've been seeing it. And this is just my way. I'd love to hear if there were other things that arose in you 
But for me, using the principles and values to help us decide how we grow this circle. How do we create a, a balance, um, a, a more diverse group of people? How do we um, empower them to feel that they have that kind of agency? I know that people have come into guardianship and visioning recently and we've just formed this bigger circle and it's actually really hard to come into people who are chum, chum, chum already working. So there's a moment here to kind of pause and really think about how we include people to feel like they're stepping into something that has agency. I'll just pause there. I'm finding it very hard to be um, a good listener in this conversation because it stimulates me too. <laughs> um, from what you've just said then, I think you're very keen to sort of w work out the magic of a working relationship with what you understand by power and to kind of materialise that in the world as, as we're currently engaged with it. Yes, thank you. You mentioned earlier, um, you mentioned something about, you know, you'd love to think or, or what it makes you think about is your personal principles and values. And um, so what, so I've, what I've been trying to do is look at, I don't, commonly think about my personal principles and values and I can see that your faith has given you a real embodied sort of practice of that and I think that has been really helpful in the roles that you stepped into that you are a person whose spirituality whose faith has given you the practice of actively using the principles that you live with in decision making. And I don't think that's something I've had much practice with in my life. I kind of feel like I'm, maybe it's a gender thing, but I feel like I'm, I more express my value, my personal values in a lot of what I do in the creativity that I express rather than thinking about it intellectually and embodying it that way. I'll pause there. I think you were talking about some kind of separation between your personal and the practical. This is literally sending me off into spirals of kind of things now. And I'm finding it harder and harder to actually focus on the words. And the kind of little bits just go pa-ding and it, it I think it's like inside a nuclear reactor when <laughs> neutrons start colliding. It's a bit like that. <laughs> so, it's, so it's really, really interesting. I, yeah. Thank you. Just in response, you know, I actually find it really fascinating when you, when I talk for, you know, three minutes and you sum it up in a sentence and it, you know, it might sound completely different, but it lands in me as, oh yeah. <laughs> Why couldn't I have said it that way, you know, so clearly? So um, I'm appreciating what it's doing. And it's your turn now, so you can go off on the uh, choose your... Yes, do. Great. Um, I mean, it might be helpful to jot down a word or two as, as things are spoken. But for me, I've just been... Like, it's hard to hold things in your mind, right, as someone else is talking. And so just catching, like ah, there's a word that I can remember as a keyword to go back to when I'm trying to reflect. And then there's another subject talked about, there's another word I'm going to hold, um, like neediness or neededness, sorry, not neediness. Um, you know, that was a word, okay, I can just hold that one word and talk about around that. 
And so just picking out single words that then became become the things that you can go back to. That's really helped me in this. Like, I mean, yeah. And I think I really recognize that um, there's often a f this frustration when we come together in these Zoom meetings and there's such a short time to do things. And some of us, our style is to talk, talk ourselves through a thought. And that's really hard when we've got a short time span and trying to have outcomes. And I recognize that people that are much more practiced at this, at being short and succinct and saying what they need and they want it, there's a frustration level that rises in people who take a little longer to talk. And it's the same in me. I have a frustration when there's people stacked up waiting and there's no gaps. I, I need silence for a few breaths sometimes between people talking for it to actually sink in before the next one starts. And it's how we recognize there are all these different threads of what people need to fully express themselves. How do we encapsulate that in a meeting? And we're doing a pretty good job of reaching for it. I think some of our meetings are just lovely. They're so nurturing. On that note, then, should we have a pause before we go in, even when you're ready? Did yeah, you? that sounds good. No, just a moment. Okay then. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated. I kind of feel profoundly different when you were both talking about sort of feeling the need to kind of make a mark on the world and, and that's kind of driving you. My dream you know, world. Who are you asking to be your listener? Uh, April. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, kind of my dream would be to literally just disappear and not leave a mark at all and i think that's kind of what drives the civilization we live in that there's lots of people who want to make a mark in the world and it's their fear of death and they're trying to anchor themselves in it that drives them to you know build bigger skyscrapers dig bigger holes have more money you know more wives more more sexual conquests more rolex watches whatever you name it and and uh, in yours obviously manifests in a different way but I don't, personally, I don't feel any need at all to kind of make a mark or to feel that anything I do kind of makes me in some way permanent in the world. It's, it's utterly different. It's, it's I'm kind of being drawn from being in service and minimizing harm, I think. And... You know, the other thing is that like Quakers have been leaderless for 370 years now. And we have a decision making process where there is no voting and nobody speaks and everyone is kind of lifted. Obviously, there are power dynamics within it. Um, and this thing around. People always keep saying to me now and it keeps coming up in different places. People say you're really like solid and calm in presence. And I, you know, when we've been doing direct actions and everything else, and I was actually asked to write about that, and this is not a drill book. And I thought, I can't actually, it's not something I can actually capture and write about because it comes from, actually, if I think what I'm realizing now is it comes from having a completely and utterly different approach to things, which kind of always leaves me at odds. Um, and when you were talking about getting specific words, that's, exact opposite way to the way I work because I go it's like an impressionist painting every little brush stroke on its own is meaningless and if you look up really close they're just little dots of color or little stripes of stripes of color and you have to go back to see it 
So for me, nearly everything that's said is just impressionistic. And then it kind of slowly builds up to something that's meaning, but it's not always instantly crystallizable into something solid. And it gets me to all kinds of trouble with people who like to be problem solving and focus on the problem as they see it. And it's, it's really, really odd for me. <laughs> Hmm. I hear another whole level of diversity of thinking. Of uh, I loved your analogy of the. Um, well, first of all, the way you talked about how your spiritual life has fed into the way that you seem to be appreciated for a sense of groundedness and rootedness and solidness and that you recognize that's come from the spiritual practice um, with Quakers and it's given you a, a different way of engaging. Than the sort of, I, well, I guess it's just that you're, you're really valuing that practice. And, and that, hmm. I, th I think the, the, yeah. the value in it comes from the fact that it's not a, a practice that you do over there. It's when it becomes you. Um, and say, I'm also strongly influenced by um, Vietnamese Zen Buddhism and this whole thing about needing to make a mark. So I always loved the bit that the way Tignat Han puts it that you know you know if you're a wave when the wave's gone the water's still there mm. there's absolutely nothing to worry about about you know as a wave you don't exist anymore the water's still there mm. thank you Yeah, I, I, that really it's dissolved that kind of idea that you need to make a mark on life or that something is left behind that has had meaning, that your, spirit, your spirituality, your practice has allowed you to really embrace that aspect of living lightly, of leaving as little mark as possible, being something that would be an aim rather than to leave a mark. Hmm, thank you. I'm aware I missed a big chunk that second bit there. <laughs> I'd like to talk to Stu then on um, hmm. I mean that's like there's this pull to <coughs> want to clarify and on on making a mark. I, you know what arose in me was you know less on making a mark but on the feeling of neededness is what kind of gets me up and keeps me going in the physicality of working through what it is I'm witnessing in life that makes me just want to uh, be really sad. And there's the dichot, you know, there's that pull in me that when I get really present to what I'm seeing around me, that that's when I fall into the kind of, uh, I can't find the energy to get up and engage. And it's the sense of neededness that there's, I'm, I'm needed to get up and keep going day to day. That helps me engage that action part of myself, I guess. I'm witnessing someone who is affected by the world around them and that brings up sorrow and grief. And that you expressing that you relate to this sense of neededness as an energy source 
that allows you to step out of the, the sorrow and grief and and to take action. Um, hmm. Thank you. And not even step out of it. It's actually to embrace it and walk with it, mm. bearing faithful witness to what is. And then there's is a moment. Moments happen, you know, often in our lives. And there are many times for many reasons where we, there are things that prevent us from stepping into moments, um, you know, shyness, nerves, um, needs of other people, have independence. There are all kinds of things that make it not possible for us to really participate in a moment. And um, we have by dint of our perseverance, of staying with this, of staying with what is and keeping going, showing up as needed, we have the opportunity to participate in the moment within this movement, another moment where things are shifting and changing and people are looking to look through a new story of what they're doing. And I would um, welcome being using that moment of shifting and changing to for us personally to look into how these principles and values live in us and how we use them as our lens of accountability to ourselves to each other to the movement um so i hear you talking about time um, and in the sense of the importance of becoming present in the now, in the, this moment, and in that presence, taking um, sort of an observation, perception of the of the world, of what is, um, and that it's by doing that in an ongoing way allows us to. Um, as a movement to um, to steer ourselves almost in um, and keep alive rather than going down um, tired and worn tracks that don't that just lead to sort of more suffering um, and that the principles and values are you useful as a guide to you in that moment and i think you're offering it as a, a guide that is used across the movement and can be used more deeply mm, thank you was that time yeah that was time thank you oh no is it just now oh, yes yeah, it's about it yeah um, all right, I'll speak to Ian. Time to you, April. Thank you. Um, so, in terms of thinking about guardianship groups, I want to think about how this group first came into being, which is when we were rapidly growing after the November 17th Bridges action. And there was talk of, okay, we have the coordination team of 13 people at the time, and we've got a decentralize and distribute power more. And then it came out that there was gonna be three strategy groups and three stewardship groups. Um, and that you could not be in, I think more than two, and you could not be in more than one strategy group. I think that was how it was. Um, and, and people were clamoring to be in the strategy groups because that was where the power was seen to be. Um, the word strategy just highlights, they'll just like, it's, it's a useless word in so many ways because people think it's all kinds of different things. And basically they think it's a way to have power and exert influence. And it's like, it's really, yeah, anyway. Um, but so those of us who joined the 
guardianship group seemed to at the time be the ones who were less interested in grabbing the power of the strategy. Um, I think that's important. In, in terms of who becomes a guardian. I'll pause. Yeah, I hear you talking about the historical sort of precedent for this. And uh, yeah, it sets me off on the idea that, yeah, you're right, there's, there were people who wanted power and people who were kind of indifferent to it. Um, yeah. And so, the guardianship group has been around and it's only basically been around for a year now, just over. Um, and there's an interesting thing that we held the group going for about eight months with very little influence. Um, you know, it's five of us, four of us um, meeting each week, not quite knowing what we are doing. And in, it's in the last sort of four months that there has been a shift of the movement going, oh yeah, oh yeah, we really need the guardians. Oh yeah. And now we're being like called on to do all kinds of things all over the place as you're the group that is most appropriate to hold these huge things. And I think what we have done is by being I think there's something around um, the valuing of all the voices, that principle from deep democracy, value all voices. Um, that it is... Um, yeah, what voice am I not valuing right now that's causing me to lose my train of thought? Um, yeah. I'm not sure I'll reflect on that as you reflect back to me, Ian. Well, interestingly, I think that you're just kind of seem to be describing to me like um, like a passive responsibility. You know, we've adopted the responsibility passively. None of us have sought it. In a way that you'd earlier described, you know, needing to make a mark somewhere, in a way with guardianship. It wasn't a place where you made a mark when XR started. It was kind of, we were kind of invited, I was invited to be there and I gather the rest of you were. And so then we've, we've come into this responsibility a different way, not because we've actually sought it out. Yeah, that we were set up as a sort of more like a watchdog who was there to raise an alarm. And explicitly at the start that uh, we didn't have a mandate to create changes. We had a mandate to bring up, hey, there's an issue here. As a movement, it's put on to you to do something about it. And so that being more the, um, the stance that we've come from. Um, and that is a sort of, it's a taking care of the movement. And so those who want to be guardians are those who have been around for a long time, I think, have some idea of eldership, and I don't mean being older, but, but in terms of valuing all voices and holding the whole, the good of the whole community. Um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, being almost a reflection to the movement in some way. This is what the movement looks like as this as a whole, all voices are welcome, all voices are valuable. And as a movement, we've got to work out how to do things. And it's not about us having the power, it's about us making sure that, or trying to make sure that the movement um, addresses the things that need addressing within it. And always giving the power, any power that's given to us needs to be given to the movement because that's where the wisdom is, is it's all of us. Yeah. Well, it's sort of, it's an embodiment almost to the maxim that, that, you know, those who want power should be the last ones ever to have it. 
you know, it's like, the, you know, the person who wants to be a guardian is probably the person who wants to be kept furthest away. It seems to be what you're almost suggesting. You know, because like Jenny kind of completely embodied that. It was like you could have a position of power in XR. I'm just not, she's just not interested in it. You know, not interested in having any like traction and being able to influence other people, just wants to go and do the stuff. So I think Jenny like absolutely embodied it in some ways. <laughs> you know, kind of the rest of us have, you know, come along on that spectrum as well, I think, to some, some degree. I spoke to her a couple of days ago. She's doing well. Good. Tough times, but doing well. Mm. I, technical point, I need a tea break. Should I pause recording and everyone take a break? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay, recording again. We've got about mm. 20 minutes left, so we're probably going to yeah. get a chance to speak each. Um, before we wrap up. Yeah, great. It's your turn first, Ian. Well, my turn to speak, okay. Yeah, who would like, to, who would you like to listen? Um, shall I go around to you and then we, we'll get a go. Um, yeah, it's interesting reflecting around what, what or who we want for guardianship. Um, I suspect it does need to be people who, are, who, who we who we invite, but it holds us to be very careful on what criteria we invite people. Because um, you do hear about people wanting to get into guardianship now because they do sense that there's some power in it. Um, and it so it beholds us to hold that power very, very gently and with a sense of service. Um, certainly a lot more work to do. But we need to equally be careful we don't just fill it with people like ourselves. Um, yeah, that's what it's coming at the minute. Mm. Yes, I heard you acknowledge that uh, there could, that this is a difficult position, um, that there's tension in even the idea that we get to choose who joins the guardianship circle. Uh, I get the sense that you recognize that might have an impact in all different kinds of places and that you would want to hold it with care. About the choices, yeah. How do we represent all these voices? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and this is one we definitely don't need to act as if we just need to fill up a spreadsheet and do some metrics. Um, because I got the sense in that elsewhere I, where I am. Because I, I, I think in, in XR, I've only ever been in groups where I've been asked to be in. And I, because kind of my favorite joke at the minute is that I'm allowed in anchor circle now because there's no power there. <laughs> you know, whereas I remember after November, after not being allowed even to witness that meeting, um, You know, because because everyone was rushing to fill up all the seats. You know, all the seats before the music stopped, and there was a crowd. You know, and you, you just got oh, everyone else has sat down. You know, it's classic human nature a lot of the time. And then it's funny how since then uh, something seems to change in a lot of people. They kind of seem to either burnt their fingers or burnt themselves out or worn themselves out or come to a realization that, you know, this is not going to happen overnight and it's a long slog. And actually, you know, because I talk to people now we're in a hurry to get involved with XHI, I say, you know, there's plenty of work left. It's not going to run out. <laughs> if you miss it for a month or something because of life circumstances, there's going to be plenty left when you 
you know, when you finish doing whatever you're doing, you come and join us then. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I heard an acknowledgement there of just how much work there is asked of those of us uh, woven into this kind of holding, this weaving at the background. Um, and I, I heard a reflection on kind of the experiences so far of that, having the perseverance that has kept you here and seeing people who've, um, for one reason or another, life circumstances and or burnout or, you know, either dropped out or coming landing with the consequences of oh it's not just going to happen quickly everyone kind of thought maybe at the beginning there was a oh we're going to do this quick that emergency messaging and um maybe it's not really how that's playing out well i, th I, th I think that's going back again to people kind of wanting to make a mark and they're kind of thinking well we can do it quickly and make that mark and get it done um whereas one of my sort of practical spiritual realizations is this, this kind of Quaker idea that nearly everything is a process and not an outcome. And if you understand you're part of the process and you just go in the process and it may take longer than your life and you're just in the process, then you can let go of the outcomes and you can just stop being gripped by all of that. And then suddenly it's easy to exist. You're, you're just in the river going down the stream. It's much easier to exist. Mm yeah again i hear the importance of your of, of what you've learned through quakerism in your life through having your a spirituality that has really helped you embrace some of the ideas that are helping you now have the longevity in but still being here yeah, and I think it's, it, it's, it's a lot about rather than learning, it's becoming. And kind of mm. I find now it's actually changing my sort of neural pathways and stuff, which is really hard to do. <laughs> That's <laughs> actually seems to be happening at last, you know. <laughs> I've been well aware of like the way I used to do stuff, but then, then you got to the point you could see it coming and you know what you were going to do. And now I can kind of stop it sometimes mm. and not just behave according to type. Thank you. That that was the rounding up and thank you. I am. Um, yeah, I, I just hear such an appreciation of all the different ways this has helped you be a thinker, really, about maybe things that you thought you weren't good at thinking about. <laughs> An appreciation of yourself. Mm, yeah, thank you. I'll uh, move to you Stu and it will give us the circle of completion thank you this has yeah this is really interesting um I was picking up I'm just reaching for a thread there was something that you said Ian that really ah, no I've lost it so I'm just going to go to ah, thinking again about how the principles and values could inform this decision-making process. Because, you know, they, uh, like I'm looking immediately, you know, our guardianship circle is three men, one woman at the moment. So I would, I would be making that powerful plea for us to have, on, to have three women before we have any more men to start to balance that gender uh, um, imbalance to start to kind of really speak up to how we have to actively promote some of these discrepancies that just keep showing up. I keep going to meetings where there's five men and two or three women less sometimes and uh, it's it's really hard to keep doing that to keep showing up at these meetings and finding 
that balance out. And I, I know it brings up lots of issues about, you know, what about all the other voices that don't get heard? And it's like, we have to start somewhere and we have to, I, I would love to find a way to, you know, embrace all these aspects, you know, the, well, as many, you know, as we're aware of. I'll leave it there just now. Um, yeah, so hearing that it is hard for you to show up to so many meetings where there's a gender imbalance and there's a majority of men or male assigned people um, and the strong desire that you have that we bring in some more female assigned people into this group um, and um, yeah, uh, respecting different voices really. Um, we probably need a couple of trees as well to join. You didn't say that, I just added it. I've been looking at the principles and values and kind of just sliding in areas where guardianship and visioning as a circle are already have things that are built into the self-organizing system and if not working are at least running and I think we can all agree that the flow of information between these circles is still needing work <clears throat> And then wondering how we can use these to inform how we grow. I guess this was part of that, just having this conversation, you know, wondering about what it means to mitigate power when we absolutely know there are imbalances of power in all kinds of ways, what does that actually mean? Trying to mitigate, to, uh, you know, create. And it's not necessarily equal it all out. It's about um, recognizing where the, you know, the way Mickey talks about it, recognizing where that there, there is a flow of, impact, impactful energy, and how do we share that? I'll pause. Um, yeah, so mitigating power or our relationship to power being really important and seeing how it impact um, things around us and um, the principles and values being, again, these guides, engaging with them being, um, yeah, I guess, guides for how to grow this team and other guardianship teams. Um, and then how else the principles and values can be used throughout the movement. Um, being critical and helping information flow, helping uh, to dig more deeply into this. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. I And I'm just recognizing that after, you know, at two hours, I'm feeling like I am actually feeling, finding it hard to follow my threads of conversation. And very often, this is where we get to a really crucial part of meetings is it was an hour and a half long or it was two hours but this last 20 minutes 10 minutes is really crucial people are making you know important decisions or reactions and i'm recognizing i'm feeling that sense of how hard it is to follow a thread of conversation at this point and um these are this is feedback 
and it, that I think is um, we're missing. We're speaking up to with regenerative cultures um, holding, but it's not, you know, we're still not living it because I'm, seeing so much tiredness and dropout and and overwhelm with the work how do we model that being better so um the the thing that you'll notice in the moment is how hard it is to keep threads and to pay attention after two hours of meeting uh, and what what does that mean for us? Um, and I'm catching Ian smiling, and I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> the suggestion is our next guardianship visioning meeting should be expanded from 90 minutes to two hours. And my thought is that is maybe do that for two weeks, but that's not an ongoing thing. When I've had two hour meetings in the past, it's consistently been um, a pathway to burnout and. Uh, degrading of the group's sense of trust and groupness. So if it is an expanded thing, I would strongly recommend it's only for a couple of weeks maximum. And if additional meetings are needed, then it's like, well, we schedule an additional meeting rather than expand it. Well, then. Mm. well that's the alternative. And yeah, I'm only as necessary. I'm not advocating meetings for meetings sake <laughs> to make ourselves feel more important. So we've got bigger meetings. Well, I, I kind of love this. It's, it's, it's sort of when the magic comes out because I think it takes everyone to stop being a little while to stop being self-conscious and mm. start being themselves. You know, and then then things really happen. This is what happened to us on the all to us on the bus on the way to Denmark. It was that like after three days together on the bus, it was like hard to like you know adopt some persona. You could only be yourself. And it's this, like Dominic Barnes talks about, it's like the hanging out is where the stuff happens. And there's not enough hanging out going on. Mm. And I also think that our early days in the guardianship where we were kind of turning up and before documents arrived and before, you know, there was much for us to do in terms of looking things over. It was, it was about supporting each other. It was about connection. We showed up to have connection. And that has been really valuable in my sense of um, being here, you know, of wanting to carry on when things are really rough. And it seems like nobody wants your voice. It's like it, it has been, this has been the rooted bit for me. And we had that great joy of those first months of just showing up and supporting each other. I want to claim my last five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, do. <laughs> um, and I'll speak to you, April, um, since you're the one that called this together. Um, so what I'm taking away from this is like this, I was showing up here believing in you, but not quite knowing why we were doing this or what was the importance and i'm coming away going yeah this has been great this has been like we've got a video here that can go out where it's an uh, i think a really rich conversation engaging with power and engaging with what does it mean to be a, a guardian and i think that's a valuable thing um for us to have and i think it's also part of our mandate of what we are accountable for we are engaging and unfolding a greater uh, awareness around the principles and values um, and engaging with them, um, which is, yeah, one of our things. Pause. Great. I'm hearing an appreciation of this uh, form of conversation of what we've got out of it. Yeah, rich, beautiful, rich, uh, connected conversation. Um, and that actually there's something that we can offer out to other people to give them food for thought and to show that that 
thought is going into how we're doing things. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It's also a, one of our accountabilities is to develop a account of the origins of Rising Up and XR. And we've done a bit of that too. And we talked about the history of this group coming in as well as our meetings. So I think that's great. Um, and then what I'm taking away in terms of bringing more people into this team or other guardianship teams getting started, I think it really is. It's about a team forms, it's got to get to know each other and to not do is really important for the first few months. Really, you know, or maybe it's six months, maybe it's a year, I don't know. But it's like the team has to really come together and get to know each other and build that trust and not be in a state of doing. Um, I think that's a really great for any team to get together and start doing, but especially for guardians. Um, because when the turbulence comes and the storm comes, in some ways we're the anchors. And we can only be anchored if we are deep and we hold each other carefully and with that strength together. And that's critical for a group. Pause. Hmm. A nice roundup of uh, that when, if we're talking about growing these groups that we acknowledge and recognize this sense of connectedness that we have evolved by having time of not having lots of demands on us and just connecting. And that this would be key in guardianship groups growing that are rooted in sharing conversations like this, conversations about things that help them connect together, understand each other's history, because this is how we recognize, um, we find compassion for each other. So their own history will be part of that. And yeah. I really enjoyed the sharing the history of us getting here. And I think the final bit then is around um, like for those who want to be guardians, being a guardian is not about wielding power and bending people to your way in any way. Being a guardian is about raising concerns, raising questions, and then explicitly it's about bringing in external wisdom sources like the circle of council or the other. It's not for us to say, this is the way the movement should be, or this is what we um, like, think the, the direction or whatever. It's for us to say, there's a, there's a hot spot here, there's an issue here, there's a question here, let's, as a movement reflect on that and then and then let's bring in other wisdom um that it isn't it's not just about us going yeah we've got the wisdom it's about bringing in um bringing in those that are not otherwise brought in mm. that's yeah so i hear that after that first step of uh connectedness and getting to know each other and supporting each other growing ways of supporting each other that the next step is that recognize it is being the um the kind of signal master like that um yeah. is it called the sentiment species the sentinel species of, of highlighting when something feels wrong with us that there are people in the group that can connect with that sense of hang on, this isn't quite right. And pointing the curiosity eye of the, the group onto this area and maybe in starting conversations like this so that people start to get connected over a tension. Yeah, 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 beautiful. Thank you. Hmm. We have come to the end of our two hours. I just want to thank Edwin Roche for uh, the Empathy Cafe style that we have used in having this conversation today. Um, I've only been to one or two and I really enjoyed what I got out of it. I saw possibilities for how this could help us have deeper conversations and I, start, and I talked about it to other people. 
And then I, last week I saw Skeena and Rupert had had a, an empathy cafe conversation and it was so rich and it was so, um, you know, opening up. It was, it was very vulnerable and beautiful. And Edwin wasn't free to host this one. So I simply looked up his notes on, you know, he has on the website, how do you host an empathy cafe? And I just read it up and this shows how anybody can host this and have some really uh, meaningful, impactful conversation. Thank it's you. Like one page document, right? Any, like it, yeah. it, it, you can do it. It's it, yeah. that, part of the excitement of yeah. Yeah, empowerment. There's tools for meetings as well, you know, how to be succinct in a short period of time. You could shorten it to three minutes and how to listen well. Um, you know, there's so many tools that some of us who are not meetings people or business people aren't used to. And it's hard to grow in a meeting, in the stress of a meeting. And this is a great practice for developing those. Oh, thank you. May you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. I think I'm seeing some of you in another two hours, Ian. Yeah. Thanks and so much. Great. Thank you so much. This has been great. And Robin, I, yeah, next conversation, let's have Robin. <laughs> thank hmm. you. Great. Are you so